Good evening and um, welcome to this uh, lecture where we are going to explore, in fact it's a set of two lectures. Uh, today and this, the next one I remind you is not happening on Friday because of Teacher's Day but we have pre it to Thursday. So, uh, and these two lectures together will be looking at the interface between India and the rest of the world. Uh, so far we have seen some of the foundations of what constitutes Indian civilization uh, and we will see some more in, in future lectures. But we have not really discussed much, you know, uh, we, we have regarded India as if in isolation. Of course India was never in isolation and civilizations are never in isolation. They always keep interacting in various ways. Uh, they may be mutu mutually beneficent, they may be exploitative, they may be warring, they may be peaceful. There are you know, many modes of uh, uh, interface. So I have arbitrarily divided, because the topic is so vast, into India's interface with the Western world, that's today, and on t Thursday, India's interface with the Eastern world. Uh, it's a bit arbitrary because if you look at uh, Central Asia, uh, which would be you know somewhere at the top of this map, uh, then it is both both Eastern and Western. But it doesn't matter. We have to uh, draw the line somewhere. And we start with the Western world because, in fact, uh, the interaction starts earlier. That's my, my only reason why I choose this. Uh, the interaction with the Eastern world is actually better known. But there is quite a lot happening on, on the Western Front also. And um, sadly these uh, very important inputs about Indian civilization and how it, it interacted, uh, with, exchanged with others is something which is again totally missing in our history textbooks or let us say in the general culture of Indians and uh, either we have a lot of fanciful material uh, on the internet in particular uh, or we have nothing at all. So let me try to show you a quick overview. It has to be brief because uh, uh, any uh, the, the interchange with any particular region of the ancient world would in itself be more than enough to fill a whole lecture. So I'm going to give you an overview, but before I begin, I want to give two quotations of uh, two great scholars. One is Voltaire, the French philosopher of the 18th century, who did not have access to Indian texts. Uh, he only knew what the, some of the first European travelers were bringing back from India and some of the information actually was not genuine but he was extremely intuitive and he was very fascinated with India uh, for a reason uh, which very briefly is because it gave him a weapon to attack Christianity and, and Voltaire spent much of his life demolishing the foundations of Christianity you know this is the age of enlightenment and um, India, China, ancient Egypt were weapons for him because it allowed him to prove to Christians that they were not the first, they were not the only civilization and they were probably not the best civilization. So anyhow, this was his, one of the motivations for his interest and he writes in 56, I am convinced that everything has come down to us from the banks of the Ganges. Astronomy, ast astrology, metampsychosis, I'll come back to metampsychosis a little later and he has this Curious phrase which I am going to come back to, to return to India, whom the whole earth needs, and who alone needs no one. So, what exactly does he say? We'll, we'll, we'll try to answer this. Now, a better informed scholar, much better informed, is Will Durant, the well known American historian who wrote a monumental history, story, excuse me, the story of civilization, I think in nine volumes. And the first volume is our oriental heritage. And he has this uh, very brief, concise and sweeping statement which is, India was the motherland of our race and Sanskrit the mother of Europe's languages, which today linguists would no longer accept. Uh, Sanskrit is a, is a cousin of European languages but not the origin of them. 
they, they, they have common origins uh, and they are very close, but uh, you cannot say that Sanskrit is the mother of Greek or Latin. Anyway, she was the mother of our philosophy, mother through the Arabs of much of our mathematics, which is quite correct, mother through Buddha of the ideals embodied in Christianity, an unusual statement that I will come back to, mother through the village community of self-government and democracy. Well, that we saw in an earlier lecture, you know, the, the initial uh, democratic institution in the Ganges civilization in particular. Mother India is in many ways the mother of us all. So it's a very high tribute coming from a great historian at a time when India was put politically under the dominion, uh, domination of Britain, of course. Uh, in fact, uh, Will Durant wrote a very uh, fiery pamphlet book, small book called The Case for India, where about the same time he argued uh, that India deserved independence. So uh, he was a great friend of India and his contribution is not studied sufficiently. Now when we start the story there are a few small small facts here and there uh, which um, uh, I won't really spend time on which point to very ancient contacts which unfortunately we cannot really explain or document. For example the presence of Kauri shells, you know those small uh, shells which are found and which come from India but which are found in uh, uh, Egypt, Kenya, even on the eastern shore of Africa uh, right all the way to the third millennium BC. So this is something we, we do know that in India and in other countries these Kauri shells were used as a kind of currency. They were used for you know to measure uh, the, the exchange of trade. But uh, through which channel, who was, who were the Indians uh, or Maldivians or whoever uh, who were trading with those regions, we just don't know at present. So uh, this is a small tantalizing bit, you know, which is a little, uh, a little reminiscent of what I showed the other day for the uh, uh, custard uh, apple fruit. You know, the fact that uh, there, there are hints of very ancient exchange routes, uh, trade routes, but we, we don't have the, the full knowledge. Uh, when we come to back to the Indian subcontinent at Mehergar, which I showed the other day in Baluchistan, for some of you who may remember, uh, about 150 kilometers north uh, west of uh, Mohanjo-daro, uh, 6000 BC, deep in the Neolithic time, well before the Indus civilization blossoms, long before, uh, almost, almost 4,000, uh, 4, uh, or rather 3,000 years before, uh, Mehergar gives evidence of, you know, small uh, crafts, uh, small ornaments made of lapis lazuli. And this is extremely interesting because it is not available locally at all. It has to come from across the Hindu Kush in a region which today, uh, this uh, Badakhshan, which today is part of northern Afghanistan and uh, Turkmenistan and uh, therefore 6000 BC for such long distance trade network to have been established is quite remarkable. Again we don't know too much about this, we cannot say uh, you know who was do controlling this trade, who was bringing uh, this uh, material from such uh, a long distance. Plenty of evidence of shell ornaments and you can see on the right here, on the left of course is uh, a, a partial view of the Mehergar Neolithic settlements uh, and on the right you have the ornaments made of shell, seashells and those seashells had to come from at least 500 kilometers away and that's the distance to the Arabian Sea. So uh, clearly people were already interested in interacting with you know far away people. And this is going to be actually uh, something, a, a phenomenon which will uh, be very Indian. You know, there is a wrong notion that uh, there was a prohibition in ancient India about crossing the sea. Uh, that's actually a much, much, much later tradition which belongs to an age where things were getting more rigid. Actually, in the very ancient times, uh, including the Indus civilization, we've already, we will come back to that again in a minute. Uh, people were actually very eager to cross the seas, very eager to cross the natural boundaries of India and, and, and you know, interact with people 
beyond the subcontinent, beyond, let us say, the natural geographic enclosure of the subcontinent. And this map I have already shown you, this shows the interactions between the Harappans here and all those regions. So the, the Gulf, uh, what is today Iran, Afghanistan of course in between, Mesopotamia and Central Asia, in fact all the way to the Caspian Sea here, close to the Caspian Sea, a few Harappan seals and artifacts were found. So, so there is an outreach, it's quite undeniable, and if we remember uh, this uh, slide again from the Harappan trade with Mesopotamia, this is about an interpreter, that is to say someone who has come from Meluha, which is probably the Indus civilization, and who is able to, to talk both languages, uh, the local Mesopotamian language and, and the, the Harappan language, and we would, we would be very, very happy to know what that Harappan language was, but anyway, that's another issue. So there was a, quite a bit of trade, and um, in fact, Sargon the Great, or Sargon of Akkad, in the uh, 23rd or 24th century BC, uh, records in an inscription, it's a kind of you know, boastful inscription where he, he, he uh, lists all his great accomplishments with great pride and one of them is that he brings, he has ships from Meluha, from Magan, from Dilmun, these are basically the regions of the, of the uh, Emirates today and Oman, uh, tied up alongside the quay at Akkad which was a port uh, uh, right at the top of the um, Gulf, of the Persian Gulf, so what is today Iraq. And, uh, and therefore, he, it was for him a matter of pride that he was able to, you know, get those ships coming from so uh, long, uh, such a distance. Now, um, among the uh, matters of import which are listed in the cuneiform inscriptions, the Mesopotamian inscriptions, are ah, semi-precious be beads, lapis lazuli. In fact, the Harappans were not great consumers of lapis lazuli, strangely. They, they were not apparently greatly fond of it. But they imported it, as we saw in Meher Garden, they continued in Harappan times, they imported it from across the Hindu Kush, worked it in workshops in the Harappan civilization, and exported it then all the way to Mesopotamia. Pearls, timber, ivory, animals, various animals are listed, and all of these together do point to the Indian subcontinent. Plus, of course, the fact that Harappan seals and pottery have been found in many parts of the Gulf. Uh, not only that, the Harappan weight system, which I briefly, briefly showed once, and I'll come back to it in a future talk, uh, was uh, in fact adopted in Dilmun. Uh, that is to say Oman, and became ultimately known to the Mesopotamians as the standard of Dilmun. This is how it is referred to in inscriptions, but it is originally a Harappan weight system. These are some of the, um, some of the uh, objects which have been found in Mesopotamian civilization pointing to Harappan presence. Uh, top left are ceilings, seal impressions on, on soft clay. Uh, I remind you that these uh, seals and inscriptions for a long time were noted, but their origin could not be understood until the Indus civilization was, was discovered and uh, the, the first Indus seals were from Mohanjodaro and Harappa were published. Uh, this is the same uh, uh, seal we have seen and various designs and various kinds of beads which are absolutely typically Harappan in, in their making. Plus uh, uh, these are uh, recent finds in Oman. You have on the left a classical Harappan uh, piece of pottery with uh, uh, leaves, uh, floral designs typical. On the right is an ivory comb uh, exactly the same ivory combs have been found in quite a few Harappan sites uh, back home. So, so uh, these objects were either exported or used by Harappans settled in, uh, uh, in Oman in all the way to Mesopotamia. There are evidences of some actually colonies, Harappans settling down there, creating their workshops, uh, creating their own pottery there. So you have, and, and therefore the situation, materially speaking, is quite complex because you can have pottery which is brought from, from, from home, 
but you can also have Harappan pottery which is manufactured locally and uh, then of course the, the technical uh, tests will easily uh, point to differences in the origin of the soil and things like that. Uh, but the question is, that's fine, we know what the Harappans exported, but what did they import? And there are so few, so few, actually hardly a handful of objects in the Harappan world, like some vase of a typical green stone, uh, which was widespread in Mesopotamia, one or two have been found in Mohenjo-daro. Uh, some a few round seals, there is a round seal at Lothal in Gujarat, which is more uh, in, of Persian style. But apart from these handful of objects, there is basically nothing of Mesopotamian origin, of uh, Dilmun, Oman. What is it that the Harappan, Harappans brought, bring back? You, you cannot do trade without a two-way exchange. And especially in those days where there was no currency, no money to deposit in a bank account, they would have had to bring something back. So the debate remains open. The best guess so far is that they might have brought copper ore from Oman. Oman is extremely rich in copper. And the Harappan world was not so rich. There were a few mines uh, in the Arabali hills of Rajasthan and possibly uh, uh, in northern, what is today northern Pakistan. But uh, these were not very, very easily accessible, and it's possible that some of the, much of the Harappan copper was actually Oman in origin, and ultimately some tests will be one day able to answer this question. Uh, gold, silver, uh, 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 other possible answers. Uh, some consumables, some food items possibly. I mean, the, the, the debate is uh, open, and we don't have very strong evidence yet to answer this question. Um, later on, when we move to the second millennium BC and uh, ultimately first millennium BC, India continues to be in contact with Mesopotamia. There are exchanges and there are signs of imports now from India. Uh, especially in the first millennium BC, India uh, starts, to, uh, you know, turning late in the first millennium BC, starts using the seven day week which was not at all an Indian concept. You know that the Indian concept is what is called Krishna Paksha, Shukla Paksha. That was actually the Indian week, if you may. It's a fortnight, but that was the Indian uh, uh, unit of time, which is comparable to the week. So this seven-day week where, uh, of course, the seven days are dedicated to the sun, the moon, and the five major planets visible to the naked eye, that is a Mesopotamian origin, definitely. Uh, similarly, with the 24-hour day, the concept of we take it for granted today that a day should have 24 hours. First of all, there's absolutely nothing uh, compelling about it. It's an arbitrary choice, and it is Mesopotamian in origin. The Indian unit, the Indian hour, was either the Ghatika, which is uh, uh, 24 minutes, or the Muhurta which is 48 minutes. You know the word muhurta in a different context, that is one particular auspicious muhurta, but the muhurta was just any, any unit of 48 minutes. So this again became uh, the hora, the Sanskrit word hora, but this is a Mesopotamian import. Possibly, there's a lot of debate about this and I'm not taking sides, the 12, the, the, uh, 12 rashis, the zodiac of 12 signs, is not mentioned in any very ancient Vedic literature. It comes in much later literature, and many scholars are of the opinion that it comes from the Mesopotamians, possibly through the Greeks, but there are scholars who disagree and try to point to an Indian origin. So here again, the debate is open. There used to be a notion that the um, Indian myth of the great flood, you know the story of the Matsyavatar, uh, the, the first avatar of Vishnu uh, who uh, comes to rescue uh, a few humans from the great flood and there is a similar uh, theme in ancient Mesopotamia and that is found in many stories like the epic of Gilgamesh uh, which has its roots all the way to about uh, 3000 BC. So there used to be a notion that this myth was of Mesopotamian origin but actually now quite a few scholars uh, think that the Indian 
uh, great flood or deluge could very well be an independent creation. A few even propose that it is from India to Mesopotamia, but this is a bit speculative. So there are many, in fact, bridges in the culture, in the cultures, and it's very often difficult to decide, you know, whether they are independent or not. If we continue with this region, we come to Iran, uh, in fact, uh, either about the same time or even possibly a little earlier, and uh, then we have to deal with a, 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 a remarkable similitude between the Rig Veda on the one hand and the Avesta on the other, which is the sacred text, the ancient sacred text of the uh, uh, old Iranians. Uh, the Avesta is, is written in a language which is Avestan, and which that language <coughs> is extremely close to uh, the Rig Vedic kind of Sanskrit. In fact, you can see here, I have listed a few examples of words, uh, and these are very well known. There's absolutely, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, the languages are very close. In fact, uh, a few of the hymns are so close that a good Sanskrit scholar could even uh, understand straight off. Not always, but very often. Uh, the difference is actually cultural more than linguistic. Cultural because in the Rig Veda, Asura means a, a powerful god, a sovereign god, a lord. Later on, later on, much after the Rig Veda, it becomes a demon as we know. But that is not at all the case in the Veda. Whereas in the Avestan, the Zoroastrian religion, Ahura becomes the mighty god, the supreme god. The great god is Ahura. So in India, it turns towards the demon, but in, in, in Avesta, it is the opposite. And the same happens with the Deva, which um, uh, in later uh, Puranic literature, for example, is of course a, a minor god, whereas in Avesta, it is a demon. The Deva is a demon, it is not a god. So there is a kind of a schism cultural schism where each one demonizes the god of the other. Something like that seems to be happening. Uh, the conventional um, theory is that the origin for both uh, uh, is at a time when the Iranians and Indians were undivided somewhere in Central Asia and then from there, you know, this is basically the Aryan invasion theory or migration theory. From there, the, the one branch came into India and the other came into Iran. Um, there are counter theories by scholars like uh, Subhash Kak, who, who is a, a well-known Vedic scholar as well as computer scientist in the US, uh, Nicholas Kazanas, who is a, a Vedic scholar but a Greek scholar, and uh, Shrikant Talagiri in India, uh, who have proposed actually that uh, the, the uh, Avesta could be an offshoot of the Rig Veda, where one of the Vedic tribes which uh, in, in the Rig Veda is mentioned as being, having been driven away uh, from the Vedic land, may have migrated towards Iran. So uh, this is a very complex debate. I can't uh, uh, go deeper into it. I just want to show that there are many opinions, as always, on these questions. But the kinship and closeness of these two cultures is undeniable. And you know very well that Zoroastrians, that is to say the Parsis, uh, because the, the, they no longer exist in Iran, of course, today, they exist in India, uh, are fire worshippers that you know, and, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, they share uh, quite a lot with the, the Rig Vedic culture. Now, when we move uh, forward in time, and we are now in the middle of the first millennium BC, and we have this huge expansion from Persia, from Iran, under uh, Darius the Great in particular, where you see in pink here the vast extent of this Persian Empire. So if you see the extreme uh, western end on the left, you see that a part of Greece has been conquered. And if you move to the other extreme on the right, you can see that a part of the uh, Indus Valley, the whole western part of the Indus Valley, has fallen under Persian control. And uh, uh, this was, um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the greatest empires of antiquity. And uh, what is remarkable is that <coughs> the, the uh, Iranians, and this is applicable to Darius and other great Persian kings, call themselves, in fact, Aryans. And Iran, in fact, the etymology of Iran 
is Aryanam, which is the land of the Aryans. And there are many inscriptions where they call themselves Aryans. So what exactly does it mean? It is not a racial term. It is something like a cultural term uh, uh, fr coming from them. And uh, it shows again the kinship with the, with the ancient Indian culture. This is a view of uh, uh, Takshashila or Taksila, one part of it in northern Pakistan, which was under uh, Achaemenid, that is to say Persian uh, control, about 500, 500 BC. And uh, you can see very elaborate town planning uh, which uh, can have complex origins, part, partly indigenous, partly um, Persian. So, but, but the city, in any case, became, for, fell under Persian control for quite some time. Then what happened is that Greece followed. Greece followed in ways which I will uh, briefly uh, uh, explain, politically speaking. But the case of classical Greece and in its interplay with India is very interesting. Very interesting, unfortunately, still poorly explored, uh, but uh, uh, still we have quite a few tantalizing bits of evidence. Uh, first of all, there are many Greek traditions, not really Indian, but Greek traditions that Greeks themselves were interacting with India. For example, here you see a tradition by Yamblikas who was a Neoplatonist philosopher, that Pythagoras, Pythagoras would be roughly 500 BC, his exact dates are a bit speculative, traveled to Egypt, Assyria, and India. So uh, this, we have no other evidence to show for this, uh, but it was known uh, in, the, uh, in Europe, for example, Voltaire, again, wrote that Pythagoras went from Samos to the Ganges to learn geometry. Now, this is an even more precise statement. Uh, but he would certainly not have undertaken such a strange journey had the reputations of the Brahmin science not been long established in Europe. The Greeks, in their mythology, have only been disciples of India and of Egypt. So now, Voltaire is putting the origin in India and Egypt. I don't know whether modern scholars would agree, probably not. Uh, uh, again, they would invoke some uh, common proto-Indo-European culture, you know, from which uh, uh, some branches uh, went into Europe and Greece and some others towards Iran and India. Whatever the exact mechanism, the kinship has to be noted. So you had uh, uh, people like Megasthenes, who was a, a Greek emissary uh, to the Chandragupta uh, Moria court in Pataliputra, which uh, as you know is modern Patna, and uh, he wrote a big uh, record of his stay in India. Unfortunately, it is lost, but we have quite a few pages quoted by later uh, Greek uh, uh, historians like Strabo, Aryan, and others, and um, uh, where he recorded his, uh, you know, his memoirs of his stay in India. And um, uh, there are other interesting tidbits. For example, the fact that we, we know for a fact that, you see, the Persians, when they controlled Northwest India, actually enrolled, enlisted uh, Indians into their army. And the Persians were waging wars against the Greeks. So uh, some Indian soldiers actually went all the way to Greece and fought on behalf of the Persians <coughs> against uh, the Greeks. They were mercenaries, if you like. And um, whether this is part of the same stream or not, we don't know. But another Neoplatonist philosopher, Eusebius, records a tradition which says that, according to which certain learned Indians actually visited Athens and conversed with Socrates. Now, this is very interesting. Whether it is true historically or not, we cannot say. This is what uh, this uh, uh, Greek philosopher tells us, of course, much later, much centuries after after uh, Socrates. But what's interesting is that they're supposed to have asked Socrates what was the purpose of his philosophy. And Socrates replied, it's an inquiry into human affairs. And then one of the Indians burst out laughing and said, how can a man grasp human things without first mastering the divine? And uh, there is an Indian touch about this question, this objection, and, and very interestingly, it comes to us from a Greek source, not from an Indian source. So we can just note these facts, and uh, note the fact that many scholars like this uh, Lomperis, 
uh, about 20 years ago, have been struck by many parallels between the Upanishads and uh, the Platonist philosophy, that is to say Plato, what he uh, uh, brings out from Socrates. Uh, there are many parallels, too many parallels to be uh, you know, a coincidence. So according to a scholar like Lomperis, uh, it is actually an, uh, an indirect influence from India. But Plato himself might not have known that it was coming from India because it was coming through intermediaries. So this is actually a, a fairly recent field of research. Well, it's been researched in the 19th century, but uh, we, we need to look at it with a fresh eye. Now, if you look at some of these parallels, uh, they are quite striking. First of all, the first row is about gods. You see the Pontians, and this was well known uh, even in the 18th century. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Hindu gods and Greek gods are just too close together. And I don't have to read out, you can, you can, make, uh, you can make it uh, yourself quite clearly. The pantheons are almost identical as far as the major gods are concerned. So how does this happen is what we cannot really answer. We have devas and asuras in India, gods and titans in Greek mythology also uh, fight each other all the time. Amrita is, you know, the nectar of immortality in India for which you remember the story of the churning of the ocean uh, for which uh, devas and asuras also fight. And uh, ambrosia is the same concept. It is also the food of the gods in Greek uh, concepts. Then rebirth, karma and uh, other Upanishadic concepts. Uh, well, the, this notion of rebirth comes first through Pythagoras and his school. And uh, it is called their metempsychosis. Uh, it's a little bit different because, you know, uh, anim uh, uh, humans can be reborn in animals, for example, which in India is not really the case uh, except in popular belief, but not in the original texts. But uh, this concept is, is quite interesting and it represents a break in the uh, ancient Greek tradition. Another break in the Greek tradition is the sudden respect for life forms appearing, pr promoted by Pythagoras. And this is something which is new. Uh, it doesn't appear before. And uh, this could be an indirect influence from Buddhism and Jainism. Especially Pythagoras was promoting vegetarianism. Vegetarianism was something totally alien to, you know, uh, uh, the older Greek culture. Concept of the Brahma's egg or uh, Hiranya Garbha, uh, you know, the, the a golden egg, which is the origin of the world in uh, Hindu mythology, and uh, the, the same concept of the world egg in Greek mythology. Concept of four ages, the Chaturyuga, uh, except that in, in the Greek concept, they are related to metals. Very interestingly, you have the age of gold, age of silver, age of bronze, and age of iron. And it's very interesting that actually it follows the archaeological order quite closely. I mean, this is, these are actually the four metals, the way, chronologically speaking, how they have been uh, worked by, by humans. So, uh, but then uh, the, the same thing happens <coughs> towards the last age of iron, uh, goddess Virgo finds humans so corrupt that uh, she decides to basically abandon uh, humanity to its fate. So there are, there are very, very, you know, striking parallels and many more have been made. Uh, I can't spend time over this, but um, uh, I want now to have a look at Alexander the Great. Great conqueror, no doubt, military genius. He was actually able to reconquer uh, not only what Persia had uh, 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 appropriated from Greece, but much of the Persian or Achaemenid Empire, uh, including Egypt and including, as we know, the uh, Indus Valley. So, his battles against uh, uh, Porus, who is represented here uh, as uh, riding an elephant, and you can see Alexander, this is a Greek coin, uh, celebrating the victory of Alexander. You can see Alexander on a horse attacking Porus, and uh, then uh, he is victorious, and here he is crowned by, uh, by uh, Nike. Nike is the Gr Greek goddess of victory. So, and here actually, uh, Alexander on another coin wears the scalp of an elephant. You can see the elephant and his tusk here, right? And this is the elephant head. So this means that 
he has conquered India. So of course he did not conquer much of India, as I mentioned the other day, uh, he had to turn back because his uh, soldiers had had enough and they threatened to mutiny. Uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is what the Greek records tell us, and lots of texts, of course, but there are interesting accounters which are recorded in later, by later Greek chroniclers, historians. So how historical those encounters are, we will never know. But at least the Greek texts tell us that Alexander was fascinated by the Indian yogis. These yogis are called gymnosophists because they were doing all kinds of you know, complicated, impossible asanas and torturing gem themselves by standing in the sun and things like that. This is what the, the, the Greeks tell us. So there are several encounters. In one of them, Alexander summons 10 of the gymnosophists and he says, I'm going to ask you 10 difficult questions and if you don't answer, probably I'll cut off your heads. Uh, he was not a very, you know, merciful uh, <laughs> conqueror. And uh, so uh, I, I have no time unfortunately to give you the ten, they are all very interested, but the fifth was asked which is older, day or night? And he answered day, by one day. So when Alexander expressed amazement, this uh, uh, sage or sadhu replied hard questions, must have hard answers. <laughs> and uh, well, we can detect something, you know, genuine of Indian humor. Uh, he asked the sixth, the next one, how could a man be most loved? You know, how, what do you have to do to be loved? So he answered, and that was a broad hint at Alexander himself, of course, if he is most powerful and yet does not inspire fear. So there are many such stories. Uh, one other which I may mention is that he actually, according to the records, he brought, uh, he took a few gymnosophists to Greece, he wanted, and actually this could have been part of the cultural dialogue, and, but the elders, the most senior of them, refused to go. And though Alexander threatened him, he did not budge and he said that I have everything I need, I am contented with what I have, I don't have to move from here and go here or there. And uh, this senior gym, uh, gy uh, gymnosophist uh, you know, remarked that Alexander's companions were wandering uh, about over all that land and sea to no profit. In other words, he was telling Alexander that, you know, all your conquest is of no use. And in fact, two years later, uh, Alexander died and his whole empire crumbled very fast. So anyway, these uh, cultural encounters are, are quite interesting. There are many other aspects to the Indo-Greek dialogue, one of which of course is art. And uh, it is a fact that uh, Indian art uh, was for a while uh, influenced by Greek concepts, Greek certain sense of aesthetics, even though it always maintained its own attitude. For example, here in this uh, head of Buddha, the features are very Greek. You know, this is Gandhara. Gandhara was the, uh, the, the region of interaction with the um, the, the, the so-called Indo-Greek kings who had remained, who were the, the, what remained of Alexander's empire in Central Asia. And, but then the, the, the attitude, the contemplative attitude is Indian, it is not Greek. So there is, there is a, a, a two ways to look at it, there are two ways to look at it. On the right is a, a standing uh, magnificent uh, stone sculpture of uh, uh, Buddha from Gandhara also. So this uh, artistic, uh, this artistic impression is undeniable. At the same time, <coughs> there were also influences in the other direction. For example, there is uh, near Sanchi uh, in Madhya Pradesh, this pillar which you see here, which is known as the pillar of Heliodorus. Heliodorus was a Greek ambassador from an Indo-Greek uh, king who at that time was ruling uh, at Taxila, it was the leftover of the uh, Alexander Empire. <coughs> and uh, this uh, Elodorus erected this pillar with this inscription, which you can read at least the first few lines of, of it. He describes himself as a devotee. And a devotee, actually the Sanskrit word is, is Bhagavata a devotee of Vishnu and he says that he has erected this Garuda standard 
uh, you know, in honor of uh, Vishnu. So, um, so it's interesting that uh, you know a Greek ambassador comes all the way to Madhya Pradesh and establishes this record here. So the, these cultural exchanges are multifaceted. They take uh, they they take uh, you know um, place in many directions. There is there are many forgotten hip episodes. Uh, some of, of course we will never get back. But a few sometimes we can we can have a few hints of things which happened. Um, for example, in Armenia we have evidence of a, which at that time including parts of Turkey and Iran, we have evidence of a Hindu colony set up by two Indian princes who had been driven out of Kanoj. Kanoj is not very far from here. In fact, it is in Uttar Pradesh. It must be, I think, 150 kilometers. Uh, west of Kampu, perhaps 200 at the most, and uh, they actually set up a colony all the way there in Armenia, and uh, first one city, and then their descendants established 20 cities, and they erected two temples, which contained a high, a very high statues of to a god called. Uh, Kisane. Kisane probably stands for Krishna. This is recorded by uh, the Syrian uh, Syrian historian Zenob Glak. So this, these, are, these are his words. And in 301 CE, when uh, Christianity was expanding fast, uh, Saint Gregory the Illuminator, this is his name, uh, uh, destroyed the temples and um, there was a big slaughter of over 1,000 Hindus and including the, including the temple priests. One of them was called Artsan, which perhaps stands for Arjun, and uh, the, the survivors were forced to convert. So this was regarded as a great victory on behalf of Christ. This is the time when uh, Christianity was expanding aggressively and you know one of the lesser known aspects of Christianity is that most of the early Christian saints were actually uh, uh, you know uh, military conquerors of this kind uh, they were given sainthood because they had uh, achieved some such objectives and these are two obelisks in this village of uh, Orsun, Orsun in northern Armenia today which still today commemorate the victory over the pagan Hindus. So these obelisks are a bit of a mystery. We, uh, nobody really knows what they must have stood for initially, but this is what the local tradition says. We move now to the time of Ashoka, simply as a reminder that uh, Ashoka sent emissaries to preach what he called Dharma, that is to say basically Buddhism. And uh, he was very keen that it should spread not only in India, and that is through his edicts in particular, but in one of his edicts, he records that he has sent, and this map illustrates this edict, emissaries to all those regions. And he mentions the king of Antioch, the king of Alexandria, Athens, and uh, Central Asia, etc. So whether he actually did it, uh, well, it's quite likely because those uh, those uh, regions were already well in contact by that time and it simply shows us that you see earlier we have a Hindu presence in Armenia which would be <coughs> which would be uh, somewhere somewhere here and uh, we had exchanges with Greece uh, with the Persian Empire and now we have Buddhism spreading over this region so perhaps that is what can one of the mechanisms that can explain why so many parallels between Christianity and uh, Hinduism, Buddhism have been noted from the 19th century onward. Uh, this is something that, you know, let us say, orthodox Christians are not really prepared to, uh, to discuss or to study, but uh, open-minded Christian scholars, historians of Christianity, uh, are quite in agreement that there is a, a Hindu-Buddhist component in the early Christianity. For example, if you take the, the Immaculate Conception, well, uh, Krishna, Buddha also have miraculous births in India. Then the, the, the uh, temptation of Jesus is very similar to the temptation of Buddha by, the, by Mara, you know, before he reaches uh, uh, enlightenment. Similarly, with the miracles of Jesus and those of Buddha, the Jesus, the, the Jesus teaching of non-violence, you know, turning the other cheek. Not that it was much 
practiced by Christians in their history later on, but the concept at least exists. And it was a departure from the Old Testament, you know, from the earliest, earlier Judaic uh, religion and teaching. So uh, this is uh, probably an influence of the Buddhist presence in the region. Divine incarnation, of course, uh, is uh, the same as the Indian concept of the avatar, except that in Christianity it is restricted to uh, the single case of Jesus and no others. Then a lot of objects of worship, of cult, which were uh, so, so similar that when the early Jesuit fathers came to India, they were so surprised that they thought some Christians must have preceded them, you know, and, and taught uh, Indians the use of the rosary, of bells, of incense, and so on, because they could not really uh, uh, accept that these were indigenous um, practices. The, someone as an art historian has even proposed uh, uh, parallels between the Chaityas, you know, in the Ajanta caves, for example, those uh, uh, Buddhist monasteries which are already quite elaborate from an architectural point of view, and the early catacombs and cathedrals. Well, this is a, a new field of research. The institution of monasticism apparently did not exist in Judaism. It is a new thing coming up with Christianity, just as in, in India it was a, a, a contribution of Jainism and Buddhism. And finally, yoga and the Gnostic Gospels. So what are those Gnostic Gospels? The Gnostic Gospels are, um, no, actually I've mixed up, I'll come back to this later. I want to deal with the Gnostic Gospels now. Um, they are Gospels which were suppressed by the early church and, you know, they chose the four canonical uh, Gospels as they are known. But uh, actually, some of them survived through a few quotations here and there. And in 1945, a whole jars containing lots of these manuscripts were found in Nag Amadi in uh, southern Egypt. And uh, these Gospels, which are called Gospels of Thomas, Gospels of Philip, Gospels of Judas himself, uh, Mary herself has a Gospel, and one is called the Gospel of Truth. So these were uh, uh, painstakingly recreated. You can see the state of the manuscript by generations of scholars. And the language is so different, so different from the canonical Gospels. For example, this one says, abandon the search for God and the creation and other matters of a similar sort. Look for him by taking yourself as the starting point. Learn who it is within you who makes everything his own and says, my God, my mind, my thought, my soul, my body. Learn the sources of sorrow, joy, love, hate. If you carefully investigate these matters, you will find him in yourself. I mean, this is something that could have been written, you know, by many uh, Indian uh, sages. Uh, you can find similar statements in the Upanishads, even in Buddhism to some extent. So this is, uh, this is quite remarkable, and I will now come back to the previous and uh, therefore, the, the, the scholars who have worked on the Gnostic Gospels agree that there is definitely an influence from Buddhism over them. In fact, uh, scholars like this one, Roy Amore, who is a Canadian professor of comparative uh, religion, and who wrote in 1978, I think, a book called Two Masters, One Message, actually made a kind of structural study of all the parables of Jesus and the miracles with all the parables found in Jataka tales of Buddhism. And he found that you could almost always parallel them. So he, he found, uh, I, I need not uh, read all these, but he found a common message between uh, Buddha and Jesus. And uh, uh, especially in the Sermon of the Mount, he found, he found that there were lots of uh, Buddhist teachings that were uh, echoed. So this perhaps uh, justifies the statement that I read out at the, right at the beginning by Will Durant, this American historian, though it is in 1930, uh, decades before Roy Amore, but if you remember, Will Durant said that, um, uh, you know, Buddhism is the origin of the 
uh, ideals embodied in Christianity. So uh, this is something that broad-minded scholars, Western scholars, Christian scholars are quite prepared to accept. And um, I think I, I can leave this out. I can leave this out. It doesn't matter uh, because I want now to come to the Roman trade. Uh, we are moving forward a little in time and we find that the successors of the Greeks, that is to say the Romans, are very interested in India and uh, the, the contacts expand very considerably. Now this is a map that shows you uh, a very very busy ancient world at the time of the Roman Empire. Now here all these are basically the Silk Road. You know the Silk Route as it is called and we'll come back to it in fact on Thursday. But we find a lot of land routes as well as sea routes uh, allowing communications between uh, all these regions and uh, we find that uh, India and China through the Silk Route are actually the dominant players. And the trade with the Roman consisted what exactly did they want from India? They wanted spices, lots of spices and uh, including pepper which they sourced from Kerala. Uh, they used a lot of pepper especially for mummification. It has very good preserving properties. Uh, perfumes, timber, semi-precious stones of various kinds, medicinal plants, silk and textiles, ivory, peacocks and so on. Um, initially the, the land, the, 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 the trade was overland, you know those uh, routes I showed you and uh, they were through uh, Gilgit and Kashmir that was the connection with the silk route. Uh, but then what happens is that the kingdoms located over those trade routes. You know, we're charging tax, toll if you prefer, uh, for all the caravans of traders to offer them protection, safe passage, they had to pay taxes. And with the increasing trade, the taxes rose to a point where, you know, the trade was not so profitable anymore. And this prompted the Romans to inaugurate the sea route. And this is, this is how it started. So they would sail from Rome to Alexandria, uh, which is of course on the Mediterranean, northern Egypt. Then they would cross Egypt over land and sail from the Red Sea port uh, all the way to Kerala first of all. Initially they did not sail to uh, also Surat in Gujarat and many of the ports on the western coast of India. Uh, initially they did not directly access the eastern coast, that they did a little later they would cross from Kerala uh, through the Palakat Pass and then they would uh, uh, travel all the way to the eastern uh, ports of India and then trade with people coming from Southeast Asia. So uh, in, in, uh, all along you have traces of this trade for example through uh, a lot of um, uh, Roman coins. Uh, and they were interested in South India, especially in semi-precious stones. Uh, South India produced a lot of them and it was called the treasure chest of the ancient world. So this is the one slide showing uh, the, the Romans returning uh, from the eastern shore, returning to, um, uh, through the Red Sea to various spots like Berenike here, then transporting goods overland and through caravans of camels and then of course on to Rome. And in Berenike for instance, archaeology has confirmed what the, the various texts has, have told us. Uh, we have quite a lot of archaeological evidence. Uh, for example here, <coughs> uh, this on the right you can see an uh, example of uh, Indian cotton. Uh, India was a major production product, uh, uh, exporter of textile. Uh, silk and cotton in particular and uh, cotton with all kinds of uh, patterns and uh, prints. So here this one was found uh, on a Roman trash dump in Berenike. So uh, quite a lot of evidence is there and also very direct evidence like this figurine uh, which was found in uh, Pompeii which as you know was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius in uh, 79 um, AD. Or C, and uh, so that you know the whole life of the city was kept uh, intact, and all the artifacts were beautifully preserved by the, uh, including human bodies in particular, were preserved by the, the lava. 
And during the excavation, such objects came to light. And this is obviously an apsara. We can recognize the typical posture of the apsara admiring her beauty in a mirror. This is what the, the, the posture means. You can see the, 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 the bangles. Uh, and you can see the general tribanga uh, uh, you know, attitude of the, of the body. So all, this is an Indian figure in which some Roman trader must have brought back. Um, lots of hordes of Roman coins have been found in South India. Uh, Kerala has a lot, Tamil Nadu has even more. Uh, the, the Coimbatore district has the highest concentration of them because this is where the Romans were passing through. You see, this was the route which uh, Coimbatore is here, so they were, they were following a route like this and then going to the uh, eastern uh, shore. So there was even a high, a rural highway, rural highway where, which the uh, near Coimbatore, passing near Coimbatore, which the Romans were using to connect to Karur. Karur is somewhere, somewhere here on the Kaveri. This one? Okay. So, so th th this was the capital of the uh, Chera kings who were ruling at the time. And this trade was extremely uh, peaceful. There was absolutely no sense of military conflict. But again, the question was, what did India import? And India doesn't seem to have imported much. So it, it looks like Voltaire had a brilliant stroke of uh, inspiration when he says, you know, uh, India which the whole world needs, but who needs no one. Because you wonder why, why uh, India is engaging in those trade. But still here we know that um, India uh, ha received, bought from the Romans gold and silver wine. There's quite a few, I mean, thousands of amphoras, you know, the typical Roman jar which uh, contained wine, and they were bringing shiploads of uh, wines to India. Uh, so this is quite in evidence, even in Gujarat. Gujarat didn't have prohibition in those days. Quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of R Roman amphoras were unearthed. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that the balance of trade was massively in India's favor. And here you have this well-known statement uh, by Pliny the Elder, famous Roman historian, which I will quickly read, in which he says, rather complains, that uh, by the lowest reckoning, India, China, and the Arab Peninsula draw from our empire, Roman Empire, 10, 100 million sesterces every year. That is the sum which our luxuries and our women cost us. A bit unfair to women because jewels and spices were also used by, by men very much, and, and dresses. In no year does India absorb less than 50 million sesterces of our empire's wealth, sending back merchandise to be sold with us at a hundred times its prime cost. So you see the economic dominance and this is a chart which I will return to later in another talk. In future, I will deal with this messy phase, not now. Um, which is by uh, Angus Madison, an American economist who did this a few years ago. He passed away now, recently. And he has reconstructed the world trade from the year zero, taking all possible sources into consideration, all of them. Written sources, archaeology, whatever. And in yellow, I've added colors, in yellow you have India uh, at 33% of the world GDP in the year zero, and China 27%. So together, 60%. You can see how interesting it is that you know, in the ancient world, these were really the dominant uh, economies. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Europe, New Europe did not exist. It was, it was just nowhere in the picture. So anyway, I'll come back to this chart. I want now to uh, uh, conclude with a few more recent phases where we have, uh, with the Arab world, uh, different kinds of interaction. Now, one which took place soon after the rise of Islam in, in the Arab world was actually a very positive interaction where, you know, this is uh, sometimes known as the uh, golden age of Islam and where uh, Islamic scholars were very keen to preserve the ancient knowledge, which was not the case later on. When Islam became orthodox, it was rather the opposite. It was more uh, in, a, in a sense of destruction, as I will show you in fact later. And uh, here we see one caliph, one particular caliph, creating in Baghdad a house of wisdom. And this house of wisdom had lots of scholars who were richly, uh, uh, very well paid in fact, and they had to translate into Arabic and Persian texts of philosophy, science, 
uh, technology, engineering, whatever, astronomy of course, uh, uh, in, uh, from Greek sources, Indian sources, etc. So from the uh, Indian side, Aryabhata, Brahmagupta in particular were translated. Uh, Aryabhata, the, and both of them were later translated into Latin from Arabic and Persian sources is very interesting. For example, uh, Aryabhata's Latin name was Ardubarius. This is recorded in the European. So uh, a lot of, and, and there's no dispute at all about this nowadays. It is very well accepted by uh, uh, all historians of mathematics that India contributed crucial inputs like the, 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 the numerals, the decimal uh, place value system of numeral notation, a lot of algebra, uh, techniques of computations, uh, and, and algorithms. Algorithms, Indians were very strong in algorithms because they permitted good computations and that's what they were interested in. And it is al khwarizmi a Persian scholar, who actually wrote a big book. His, book, his first book was on the mathematics of India where he used basically Brahmagupta's text because Brahmagupta is sometimes considered as the father of algebra and explained the Indian techniques of algorithms. And actually algorithm, the word algorithm, is nothing but a European uh, Latinized corruption of al -Khwarizmi. So it's interesting that algorithm, a word you are using probably every day, has an Indian background because al khwarizmi was basically explaining the Indian techniques. But there is another side to the uh, Islamic encounter, and uh, this is uh, uh, told to us by Al Biruni, famous uh, scholar of, uh, originally from Central Asia, uh, but uh, fluent in Persian, in Arabic, and he learned uh, Sanskrit apparently. Uh, who visited India, spent quite a long time in India, but he visited as part of uh, Mahmud of Ghazni's entourage. And he authored a book which is still available. It is called Al Biruni's India. It's a very int interesting book. And he tries to be quite objective, although uh, he's definitely Muslim and he ha definitely considers Islam to be superior. But nevertheless, he wants to know what knowledge uh, was there in India. And he has a tough time. He has a tough time because, first of all, he is with Mahmud of Ghazni, which doesn't really help because uh, Mahmud of Ghazni had a very destructive military campaign. But he keeps interacting with the Brahmins, with the scholars, and he finds them, he says, niggardly in communi communicating that which they know. He complains that they think that there is no country like theirs, no nation like theirs, no kings like theirs, no religion like theirs, no science like theirs. See how times have changed. So, <laughs> so this is Al Biruni on, uh, on uh, the Hindus. But then he explains, and he explains, and I, I have almost uh, done, just a few more minutes. He explains that uh, Mahmud utterly ruined the prosperity of the country. That re refers especially to uh, Gujarat, a bit of Rajasthan, U what is today UP, not much more than that. And performed their wonderful exploits, of course, military exploits, by which the Hindus became like atoms of dust scattered in all directions. This is the reason, too, why Indian sciences have retired far away from those parts of the country conquered by us and have fled to places which our hand cannot yet reach. And this is a very factual historical statement which explains that uh, the, 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 the scientific developments in mathematics, astronomy in particular in northern India became disrupted. The mechanisms of transmission of knowledge uh, were severely disrupted and um, uh, uh, in fact we see the, the uh, uh, scientists moving towards the south. For example, Bhaskaracharya was probably in northern Karnataka, uh, that is uh, now we are in the 12th century BC. Then you have the Kerala school of mathematics and astronomy from the 14th century BC. So there's a movement southward and, uh, and the development of in indigenous Indian sci sciences was certainly hampered by this. There are, of course, many other exports from India. We cannot possibly deal with all of them. I just want to mention wood steel, which I will return to in a talk on technology. So I'm not explaining now for those who might not know what is this wood or Damascus steel. We will visit it later. The fact recorded uh, uh, in Persian literature that uh, Indian astronomers were brought 
to Baghdad and Damascus to set up observatories. This is very interesting for us because we don't have, in, in the 9th century uh, AD, we don't have evidence of observatories back here in India at that time. So it's very important to have this confirmation that Indians could build observatories. Chess, Panchatantra, uh, so many collections of stories have uh, uh, migrated. It is well known that the Arabian Nights, the tales of the Arabian Nights, have been much influenced uh, by the Panchatantra in particular. Ayurveda also traveled quite a lot. I, I did mention Sushruta and Charaka in one of my slides. And um, uh, uh, the Roman Empire used uh, uh, some Ayurvedic medicine, but also, as we will see uh, day after tomorrow, on the eastern side as well. So to conclude, I'll just read this kind of summary. It's uh, in a nutshell, one uh, Muslim scholar from Basra in the 9th century who gives his own impression and testimony of you know, the contributions of India. And he says, I have found the Indian people extremely advanced in Jyotisha, meaning as astronomy and mathematics. They occupy a very prominent position in the field of medical sciences, you see Ayurveda as I said, and possess such secret knowledge that they can cure serious incurable diseases. They are excellent in carving stone statues, making colored paintings on the niches of the buildings. They are the inventors of the Chaturang, which is the precursor of chess, Chaturanga in Sanskrit which is one of the best intellectual games. Their swords are extremely fine. This is wood steel, we'll come back to it. They are fond of swordsmanship and they are masters of this art. They can neutralize the effect of poison by their mantras. Their music is attractive. There are many types of Indian dances which are very popular. So you can see that uh, the, even though this is a, a Muslim scholar, uh, this is a time when uh, there was still quite a lot of intellectual artistic exchange taking place and uh, then of course then of course we would have to jump uh, o uh, over the whole I'm just uh, skipping this and this is my last slide over the whole of the colonial period which I was not pro pro proposing to deal with I, am, I was restraining myself to the ancient world which is rich enough but I just wanted to show that uh, India's influence uh, in con is continuing in many ways, sometimes unexpected and sometimes better known. Uh, this is the <coughs> statue uh, of uh, Nataraja Shiva, uh, which has been erected a few years ago at the request of the Indian government, uh, because uh, Frijot Capra, you might remember in his Tower of Physics, uh, this was my previous slide which I have skipped, uh, was uh, comparing the dance of Shiva to the dance of subatomic particles. So uh, the government of India had this uh, good initiative and in fact the quotation of uh, Frijot Capra is, is engraved somewhere uh, at the base of this uh, statue. And of course, of course, many other ways through which India continues to influence uh, the, the Western world, uh, even without trying to. In fact, uh, this is something I will come back to uh, um, day after tomorrow, the fact that the, all these interactions were basically peaceful ones. India did not try to militarily concur. There is one exception which I'll give next time uh, to militarily concur any of these cultures, any of these civilizations. It was quite happy to, you know, give, share the knowledge, uh, share the goods. Of course, get enriched also uh, through the trade. And uh, this is a, 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 you know, a kind of model to my mind. Uh, in what we call the dialogue of civilization. So India did dialogue quite a bit and uh, we will see day after tomorrow the dialogue with the Eastern world. Thank you very much. <laughs>